Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society, bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love, Shamika Michelle, and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love, alongside my co-host, Shamika Michelle, what is she reading? And Wilfred Riley. <laughs> and our guest this week is Peter Pischke. He is a freelance writer who writes on health issues. And um, we're going to talk about one of those today. Uh, start off by talking about the opioid crisis. And I think that um, it's something that you see a lot in the news, but very few people talk about it. So it's going to be interesting. Peter, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I really appreciate being here uh, to get ready for this. I listen to your podcast. It's pretty cool. I get to go on a podcast that you've had so many uh, big people that I already knew about. Jason Riley, Tucker Carlson. I've listened to those. Uh, and I already know uh, Professor Wilfred, who is just awesome. He's one of the smartest, coolest guys I know. So huh. thank you for having me here today. Huh. So I guess that leaves Shamika and Charles at a disadvantage, but that's okay. I'm used to it. Uh. <laughs> No, but um, the opioid crisis is interesting because for those, it's one of those weird topics because for those who follow the news a lot and read traditional news, read the paper, they probably like, yes, this is a big story and we hear about it a lot. But for the rest of us, not so much. It's one of those things that, that you hear about in certain circles. So I guess let's get everybody up to speed by talking about what is the opioid crisis that's going on in America right now. Yeah, no, I certainly agree about um, the audience that pays attention to these issues. A lot of times it comes disability issues or chronic illnesses in general. It's something that's kind of on the sides of society. Um, it does affect everyone in some ways. We all have family and friends that struggle with the, with health problems or if not ourselves. But uh, it, it doesn't always manage to break through into uh, the, the main news culture, that's for sure. So the opioid crisis, probably what you guys are familiar with is what you can see on Hulu right now with the dope sick, which is... Um, uh, pharmaceutical companies in the 90s pushed heavily on painkillers. A bunch of people got addicted to them. And then somehow we ended up in the 2010s where a lot of people are dying from uh, opioid overdoses. Um, my work covering the opioid crisis, the story is a bit more complicated than that. Actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. You have factors like the drug war, of course, that took place in the middle of the 20th century. You have the, the many factors that are in the opioid crisis. Uh, there is a very strong case to be made that the narrative that pharmaceuticals like painkillers were the main creator of the opioid crisis and and for sure right now are not. But th there are a lot of arguments there to be have. My work is mostly covering um, talking about the history of the topic, interviewing people, talking to patients. Uh, the opioid crisis is pretty big, though. Even, today, we have about uh, between from sorry 2020 to 2021 we had 90,000 Americans die from overdoses to an opioid medication mostly uh, illicit fentanyl that's a lot of people and it looks like next year when we get the stats back it looks like we're going to add at least 10,000 on top of that so that's a lot of people every year who are uh, dying from opioid drug overdoses but what they're dying from is not what you think. It isn't anything really that comes in a prescription orange bottle. They are dying of black market fentanyl. Fentanyl in the medical setting is one of the biggest painkillers that's used in, to make surgery possible. It's used in end of life care. If your loved one has like a end stage cancer, that is commonly medication to be given, but it's a very powerful medication. And the black market really likes it because it's cheap to make. And so they can import it from uh, across the southern border or import it via China. And so that is kind of dominate the black market. And so what people are overdosing on isn't um, Vicodin, isn't Oxycontin. What they're overdosing from is fentanyl that's mixed in drugs. Most of the time they don't even know that it's in it. Uh, and it's a complicated issue. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll shut up now so you guys <laughs> can uh, ask your questions and stuff. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big topic. It's a heavy topic. Right. Um, I guess we can get more into what that problem is, but I kind of want to jump to the end and work my way back. So why is it that it is covered differently from other crises? What do you think about that? Like, why is that the case? Well, 
for one, it's interesting because uh, Americans love stories about drugs. That That's always been something that fascinates them. Um, for another, in the 2010s, okay, so previously to the 2010s, the people who were dying of drug overdoses typically were poor whites or they're people that were African-American, et cetera, et cetera. That was the ba you know, the bulk of the drug war in the 20th century. That's where the, the focus was. Remember, like there was even sentencing disparities with the drug war between powder and crack cocaine. That was the general, the audience that was being affected by this problem. The people that are being affected weren't people that had a big voice. They didn't have a lot of impact in, in business. They have a lot of impact in the media. They didn't have, you know, these aren't the kind of people that end up at Harvard and Yale. So what was happening to them, to the people who cover drugs as drug reporters, they would report on that, but most people weren't aware of it. Whereas in the 2010s, what happened was the opioid overdose crisis was affecting people who were upper uh, middle class, who, who were upper elite whites. You know, uh, there's so many stories and I, I hate to, uh, he, he's a good guy, but Eric Bowling, he famously, he's the Fox News host, and he famously, this kind of became a crusade of his after his son overdosed on, um, on uh, uh, an illicit substance, which was uh, fentanyl, the opioid. And that brought a lot of media attention. That kind of thing wasn't happening before. The people being affected typically weren't the people who had any voice in the process. You know, there's a lady, a reporter in my area, and, and her daughter, similar story. The, the kid took what she thought was Adderall, right? She gets it from another kid. She wants to study for a test. And what she didn't know, it was laced with fentanyl and it kills her. Well, that, that that's big news because this is a person in the media with influence. These are people that previously, the population, the black population that was really hurt by the policies in the 60s and 70s, they just didn't. They just didn't have the same place in our, our cultural consciousness that the people who are being affected by this now. And, and those people, by the way, those other populations are being affected, but we're really only noticing it now because um, upper middle class people and the media, they see it and they want to talk about it. And that's not even to talk about things like big litigation, and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay. So um, I think the three of us will have, you know, some interesting, unique perspectives based on where we are. I'm in New York now, but I came from Indiana and Will's in Kentucky, Shamika, North Carolina. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is, it affects everyone, but regionally it's a little bit different. So I guess I want to go to Will first um, and see what he has to say about, you know, what you've mentioned so far and what the uh, issue is. You're on mute, Will. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that this is interesting on a lot of different levels. Um, I'm actually curious, like in general, I find that there are a lot of issues in the United States that affect poor whites bluntly as a group that nobody really pays a lot of attention to. Uh, suicide comes to mind, for example. Like in general, I think that if something affects rich people who are mostly white for a bunch of historical and demographic reasons, but rich people, people pay attention to that and sort of care about it. And there's a lot of virtue signaling that goes along with pretending to care about like black inner city issues because most rich people live in big cities so the poor people that you see are very often minorities or you know ethnic guys whatever that live in the same city a lot of these heartland issues don't really get a lot of play so i mean when you said a uh, hundred thousand people are expected to die from opiate overdoses this year i mean yeah th that's something that's been going on for a while. I mean, when I wrote about that for Taboo, it was about 70 or 80,000 a year. Um, and until very recently, when, as you said, richer people started dying, nobody really gave a shit. Nobody cared. So there, there's this focus on very specific things, either stuff that doesn't matter at all, like the Central Park dog walking arguments we've seen, or things that do matter, like, quote unquote, black on black crime, but that come from the cities where a lot of the people who attract visibility live. So I, I just think it's interesting that, I mean, like the 100,000 people a year is five times the number of murders. Um, but in, until recently, no, no one's paid much attention. Uh, that There wasn't really a point there other than just a discussion of the fact that America has class, race and regional issues, a truly shocking revelation. But I mean, I guess if, if I'm gonna hit you with the question, Peter, what caused this exactly? I mean, I did watch Dope Sick, and I mean, it's it strikes me as, you know, guy from the business world that doesn't think people there act all that ethically, that we've been allowing corporations to just <laughs> sell drugs for a while. Like, I mean, if you read the side of an Adderall bottle, it lists all the ingredients, and there are only two. It's amphetamine and salt. So, I mean, corporations have been getting away with this for some time. 
Um, what what happened? What touched off the opiate epidemic? Getting getting so many people to the point where they started experimenting with heroin in their off hours. Yeah, so I'll try to summarize the history a little better than I have here so far. So basically, um, following alcohol prohibition, uh, there was a change in attitude about accessing drugs. It wasn't just about alcohol, but it affected other things. So for most of the 20th century, there was kind of what they refer to as an opioid phobia. If you go watch a lot of movies that are in a hospital setting from the 70s and 80s, there are many storylines about some doctor trying to figure out how to treat their patients without getting addicted. I just watched uh, this obscure Japanese movie about a Japanese hospital, and this was one of the main plot lines. This was a thing people were really worried about, and so the the use of opioids to treat pain, especially even for things as terrible as like cancer, was relatively rare. Um, and so when they were looking for health reforms, even today, the no third number uh, cause of death is medical errors. So there are ideas about reform, and one of them was, okay, well, let's make it so pain access, pain, sorry, pain medicine access is available to people. And that was a good idea. And what happened in the 90s was uh, uh, the Sacklers at Purdue came up with this product called OxyContin, which the idea was this is a continuous use medication. Unlike previous opioids that you would use in a medical setting, which attached to something like acetaminophen, and there'd be lots of problems of liver toxicity, the medications wouldn't last very long. Now you could have a medication that could get you through your day. You could get through your work day. Um, but it was falsely advertised. The medicine, while well, it kind of worked like that at first, um, with opioids and many drugs, you develop a tolerance and the, the benefits and how long it lasts decreases. At the same time, not it wasn't just, um, you know, there's a lot of dope sick and those kind of narratives do like to put the onus on uh, pharmaceutical companies and they definitely had a role. But they did this at the behest of the federal government, um, the VA, the FDA, even the CDC. They pushed hard for this idea of total pain care. Okay, there, there was for a long time from the 90s until the beginning of the 2010s, if you were a doctor and a patient reported that you didn't take their pain seriously enough, you weren't trying to get them effective care, that could be a big ding on your record. So doctors and physicians and hospital systems are really worried about this. Uh, and so there was a, a misuse in that sense that pe some people were getting opioid pain medication they didn't need to, or they're getting it too long. So you go to the dentist, you get your wisdom tooth, maybe you'll get, instead of just like a week, of oxy or Vicodin, you'd be getting a month. So there were definite problems there. But what, what what people didn't really care about this issue in the 1990s and the 2000s outside of, say, Appalachia, where these things were happening. They cared when people started to die. And what touched that off was the, the under the Obama administration, public health came up with this, with this big brain idea. And their idea was, okay, so in Appalachia, they take a drug like OxyContin, and they'll turn into a paste. They'll add water. They'll mix it down. It becomes paste-like. And then they can inject that in because it's it's kind of like uh, a poor man's heroin. <laughs> and their idea is, okay, so let's make it so oxy you can't turn into a gel. And then that will stop the addiction problem. Um, and, uh, you know, it's painful because it's a little obvious. You're like, that's not going to work, guys. So they, they, But they did it. This was their idea. And what it did was it took all these people who are using a relatively, what they refer to in uh, drug reporting as a safe supply drug, in the sense that this we know what's in this, we know who made it, we know it's not tainted. And it took these people and pushed them on the black market and much more dangerous substances. And that's what kicked off the deaths. It, you took people who were are kind of already addicted, and it's hard to tell if it was a greater amount than the people that might already have addiction problems. A lot of Americans do. Um, it, it, that's unknown. But what we do know is the Death Star, because it was the, um, the interaction of the federal government making these top-down decisions. And we've kind of been dealing with that problem ever since. And the attitudes and policy solutions they've tried to come up with ever since have not worked. They have done the very opposite. They've only made the situation worse. Well, I want to get to Shamika and, and, and talk about a different angle of it. But one thing you said that's really important that I don't even know what the number is, and very few people, I think, know about it. And, and it's striking. And I don't know what the number is now. Like you talk about the deaths going up each year from when Will wrote about it before, anticipated it's going to be higher the next year. But you mentioned medical era. And in my last book, I, I was referencing that kind of from a framework of what people pay attention to talking about race and all these other things. And at that time, the uh, number was a quarter million people die every year because of medical error. And that was 
four years ago. So I can imagine what that number is now. Uh, but no one knows that. So I just think that's a striking and interesting fact that people should think about when they're saying that some of this thing is intentional or when they get hyper excited about something in the media, think about that quarter million people. Nobody, it's not even a blip on the screen. But Shamika, um, Will was talking about, um, how people patronize, uh, and, and virtue signal blacks and how when people rich, something happens to them and they add notoriety, people pay attention to that, but not so much from the standpoint of, um, the poor and somehow the poor whites get left out. But there's a the flip side to this too. Peter was talking about the war on drugs and how they were fighting this and whether it was well-intentioned or not, that it kind of cracked down and, and uh, put a focus on blacks, locked a lot of black people up. And so now there's a segment of the population, I'm sure you've seen and heard this, right? Well, when, when we started to hear about the op opioid crisis being prevalent in the white communities, there was an, kind of an indifference, right? Uh, the people were like, well, nobody cared when it was us. So, you know, you know, what's the big deal? So, but that also happened at the same time when people saw it was an issue and said, we need to address it. They say, oh, now you care and you want to, uh, treat it as a health problem when white people are doing it. But when black people are, you want to lock, lock people up. So that's an interesting dynamic, right? And you can kind of see their point. But at the same time, there weren't 90,000 people dying. So it's a different thing. But what do you think about that and how it's viewed? Yeah, I definitely hear that all the time. I've heard people say that directly to me, like, you know, oh, now they, they want to care. But when it was black people suffering, they didn't want to claim it was a medical issue. They claimed it was criminal and just locked black people up, never tried to get them any type of help for the addiction that they had. They just wanted to send them straight to jail. And I can honestly say that, you know, I'm glad that it's affecting higher class people or white, you know, elites now. I say, let them die. You know, I thank you for having to, you know, take the fall to help the, the, the lower person, you know, appreciate it. We all got to leave here some kind of way. So, you, you know, thank you. Go ahead and die. Every time I see a video of Hunter Biden, you know, a lot of people want to make him this hero. I'm, I'm excited. Let's, let's put him all across the TV in his underwear, you know, letting somebody massage his penis with their feet. Let's just, let's just see it all. Put it all out there, Hunter, because, you know, I am so happy now that it's Hunter Biden or Biden or somebody that's, you know, supposed to be a prestige opposed to poop. Uh, Pookie and Ray Ray, because that's all I'm used to is Pookie and Ray Ray on crack and, and nobody cares. So now if this is the way we have to get help in the black community or for things to change and people to actually see this as a sickness and not just some type of criminal issue, then let them die. Bye. Right. right. It, it, it's but, you know, like when he talks about the genesis, it's different, too, though, because you know, however they, we agree or disagree with the way they handled it, uh, most people disagree, but it's different because that started from, you know, Ill illegal transactions, right? Whereas he's saying, what Peter's saying is they were pushing it, right? So people got, got prescriptions that they couldn't get filled anymore, but now they got an addiction, right? So now they're buying something different to supplement or to solve uh, an addiction that was created based on a prescription where it was recreational from the start. So, you know, not justifying the response, but it is a difference between the two, right? Wouldn't you say, Shamika? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I actually, I think that this, I think that's an important point, honestly. I, I mean, I, to some extent, I agree. I will say, to some extent, I agree with Shamika. I'm not very sympathetic to celebrities that have personal problems. I mean, when you see Hunter Biden selling finger paintings for $500,000 and so on down the line, I mean, it, it's very, the only way a Hunter Biden painting would be worth any substantial amount of money is if he sneezed on it. Like he has personal issues, but there's also the obvious fact that he has the money for rehab. So right. the, the attitudes there vary. But I, I think when you're talking about like why people react differently to the opiate epidemic, there is racism in society, but you can only identify racism when you've eliminated all of the other differences. I think that's one of the main things I write about in my academic role, actually. And with the opiate epidemic, one of the obvious things that made the people involved sympathetic, first of all, nobody gave a damn about them for many years. I mean, there, there were jokes about people on Oxycontin in the backwoods that just sounded like the old jokes about crack. But when this actually started reaching into the public space, I think part of the reason people cared was that the drugs were legal. 
Like, the issue was that these large companies had been selling Vicodin and Oxy and all this stuff to everyone's grandmother or, like, the war veteran in your family. And when doctors finally cut off these prescriptions under pressure from, like, Congress, people started desperately going out and trying to find heroin or fentanyl or whatever to deal with these addiction issues they then had. So the people that were addicted to opiates very often were people that you knew. Like, there were athletes I used to compete with that had serious opiate problems. Whereas most people in the white or the black community, at least since the 80s, don't know that many people that are regular crack smokers. Like, there's definitely, there's definitely a class-based difference there. Like, if I went over to my buddy's house and he had a bottle of Oxycontin on a table, we might talk about his drug habits. But, I mean, if I went over to my buddy's house and he started smoking crack, I'm leaving. Like, it's, it's not something that you see a lot of across class lines, just someone breaking out a glass pipe, like you're ready to get down. So opiates had a much bigger footprint, I think, in the working, in the middle class. Everyone that came back from Iraq was prescribed these drugs for a while. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And that, that's, that's one of the things that strikes so many people as so unfair about this, I think, first of all, that these large corporations were able to legally sell drugs. And I'd actually be interested in talking about white collar crime in general a bit dur during this, as, as someone coming from that sales floor, trading floor sector more than sales for him. But I mean, like, one, these big corporations got away with selling dope, and two, then they just stopped, and all these people were addicted to drugs, and they started, you know, driving down wherever and buying another version. And then the fentanyl, fentanyl is a new element to the game. So, like, last line for me, but last year was the first year ever that almost as many blacks as whites per capita died from specifically drug overdoses, like heroin and all this other garbage you put in your body. And that's because fentanyl is coming in from Mexico now. And a lot of the stuff people take in the hood, like, quote, unquote, molly, just the party drugs, is cut with this. So if you, and you're making this stuff in, like, pill presses in your garage. You're not a fucking chemist. So, like, if you take a pill and they just got the dose of fentanyl wrong by 800%, game over so that that's happening all the time you're now seeing these ods among like working class black men they're partying with like their buddies from the firehouse so yeah. that that's how this is this is crossing group lines but the reason people started caring i think was that opiates were a drug used by soldiers a drug used by relatives because they were a drug sold by pfizer this this wasn't something under the table that you had to go to a house full of hookers to get yeah that's and true we just lost two people here um in our community for, because of fentanyl and uh, people were saying I didn't know they did drugs but I think it was just something they got together one night they were partying and didn't know it was laced and both of them were found in the home dead the wow. one one quick comment here like I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of George Floyd as a human being but like when people say he he was on this mixture of like meth, cocaine, fentanyl, all this other stuff, what that probably means is that he took something that was sold to him as Molly. Like he didn't take he didn't do two lines and then take a fentanyl pill and then do something else. Fentanyl is the cut because it's so cheap and strong that's put in most drugs. So, like, if you scratch the average X pill at a rave or whatever it's called these days, I don't know. Leave that to the kids. It's but I mean, like, called rave. <laughs> bestie whatever and like i mean i'm not i'm not twirling glow sticks around at this point in my life you know come on but anyway so like but the point is though that if you if floyd almost certainly took something that had been sold to him as coke or mesh they sometimes call it in kentucky or molly and that had this substance in it and that's what caused this erratic reaction that started off i mean that that awful police encounter like, the guy was going crazy like there were these the effects of the drug were very, very visible. And that's what you often get with badly mixed fentanyl. I mean, that, that, that's really the point. Fentanyl well, is another element to this because it's so much stronger even than the opiates we've known. It's a synthetic quadruple strength opiate, if I understand that correctly. Well, well, well that leads to two points. One is something that Shamika brings up pretty regularly. And is an, another is just a common sense place to lead, even though we're talking about opiates. So the, to the Shamika angle, you know, Shamika, we've talked about you know, crime a lot, and we talked about violent crime or whatever. And I think on the violent crime episode, we were talking and you were like, well, and, and I said something about it depends on what you consider violent. And you were like, yeah, well, drug dealers, you said something about drug dealers. And well, not the drug dealer I was married to. But <laughs> that's the thing, you know, when we talk about from a criminal justice standpoint, a lot of the people reform us, forget about the police side. They're saying, like Peter mentioned, the uh, disparity between crack and, uh, and powder cocaine. And they have problems with that, with, with sentencing and, and the arrest. Like, should we be arresting people for, for this kind of thing? It's a health crisis and all that kind of stuff. 
But that mostly goes for the person taking it, right? But the people that buy from, they're not getting it started off, you know, in the, in the plush doctor's office, but that's not where they're getting it, you know, satisfying their addiction now, right? They're buying it off the street. It's mixed with stuff. So if a hundred thousand people are dying every year, at what point do we consider the person who's doing that stuff? Maybe not a murderer, but it's kind of, you know, it's leading to a very violent end. So. How do we square that circle where we don't want to police nonviolent crimes and we don't want to, you know, make everything, everyone like a, a murderer or a stick up kid or something. But at the same time, you know, this is affecting a lot of people and it's taking a lot of lives. And the second thing I want Shamika and Peter to, to respond to this, uh, you've been, you know, I'll go to you first, Peter. But the second thing is the, the immigration thing. We have this immigration battle and everybody makes it about the, about what we want to do with our borders who we want to come in, the workforce, and who who's coming over, right? These are poor people, we should allow them to work, which is a factor of it. But no one talks about what this enables, right? How fluid borders with no security makes it easier for people to traffic other people, makes it easier for the fit and all to get here. So, you know, let's talk about how those things tie into the 100,000, you know, so we got the 100,000 deaths, you talk about the drug itself, but all these other things kind of exacerbate that problem, right, Peter? No, exactly. And you're touching upon, which is the whole thing that uh, on both sides of this issue is what fuels it. And it's, it's this idiocracy that has kind of taken over um, our elite institutions and those with power. And you kind of see this with the drug war, where there's this attitude of there is one way and one way only to deal with the problem, and that's to arrest more people. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Wilfred Riley knows I am definitely about having law enforcement available to communities when they need it. But part of the problem with, with this method was it ignored a lot of the causes that were there, and that's what they've tried with this current epidemic. And the problem is, is the ones that they end up punishing are the physicians, including the responsible ones, and the patients that actually need these drugs. You know, most of the people who abuse um, you know, something like Oxycontin and they, and for, to fuel their addiction problem. It isn't something that's usually prescribed to them. They're usually getting it from their relatives, you know, medicine cabinet, many times stealing it, you know, taking it without permission. The problem is how do you, how do you punish a physician and they are trying to take a legitimate patient, someone that might have cancer or they might have AIDS, they might have sickle cell. And then someone comes along and they take their medicine. And that trying to just use a law enforcement top-down approach to deal with this issue, you end up hurting that person. So you may, in theory, think that you're going to stop this person as an addiction issue from getting the medication that they might hurt themselves with. But at the same time, you've hurt grandma. And I've met with, I mean, it's, it's incredibly depressing to cover this beat because you meet with so many people and so many families where they have someone that has a legitimate health need and they need access to pain medication. Maybe it's an end of life thing. Maybe it's a chronic pain thing, whatever. And they can't get it. And they don't understand. I've obeyed the law. I always followed the rules. Our doctor here has the proof this is a real thing, but you're punishing me anyways. And it really is an idiocracy. I mean, there are reports that this wasn't covered in Dope Sick. They, this was also in an HBO documentary that came out earlier this year where they talk about how we went to the big companies that, that um, will move these drugs and they didn't ask enough questions. Well, what they don't tell you is the DEA had no way to measure if anything they were doing is successful. They've had to admit it. One of their big whistleblowers they all rely on, Joseph Ranazizi, who got fired because he threatened a member of Congress. He admitted on the record the DEA did not have a way to measure if anything they were doing is working. And you can see this kind of attitude all over the place. If you ask the FDA, okay, so what is problematic opioid prescribing? Well, you know, you're a doctor, I want to know, how much is too much? When am I going to prescribe and get to get to trouble? And here's what the official FDA stance is. I, I, I might have to find it. But uh, it, basically what it says is there is no consensus for over prescribing they don't have a number they just have a vague notion <laughs> and it, it, it's it is so damaging to so many people so not not only are we hurting people who have addiction issues because we have more people dying every year but we've also hurt people who have major disabilities and the worst part is i mean it's one of the not the worst but it's one of the worst is the media celebrates this you can go to the new york times right now and they've had multiple reports where they talk about disparities in medicine. So they say African-Americans, they can't get pain medicine, particularly sickle cell patients. And then they say, and this is why it's a good thing. I mean, it's crazy town. It, it's, 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 it's insanity sometimes. And it, it'll just 
drive you crazy because you say, okay, let's focus on where the problems are. Definitely like, where are these black market drugs coming from? Yeah, right. And they're like, well, we don't really want to touch that because that, you know, that immigration issue is too hot. So what are you going to do, guys? Well, we're going to focus on the disabled patients and their doctors. You've been trying that. It doesn't work. Right. And I mean, it's, it, it's madness. It's depressing and it's madness because you know, we know these policies do not work and they keep doing them. Right. I, I just don't even know what to say to that sometimes. Right. Shamika, what do you want to say about either one of those two? Immigration or the, uh, criminalizing uh, the people who are bringing the fentanyl in? Um, you know, so I'm just trying to think if when we talk about some of these drugs, the one, especially the ones that are legal, like who do we penalize? Uh, do the doctors ever suffer any type of penalty or the That's what he was saying. He was uh, talking about companies. when they had a thing where they wanted to charge doctors for over over prescribing, right? They doctors should. have gone to jail. But they but but he just said there's no standard of what over prescribing yep. is. Well, I I've, I've seen there, there doctors a... uh prescribe heroin addicts, you know, or recovering or recovered crackheads or heroin addicts <laughs> oxycontin. So I'm just thinking like if you know they had a previous issue, but you don't care, you just want to get them out of uh, your your uh, doctor's office, like do you hold any type of blame? Like so, but let's just say if I let's hypothetically say I had a cyst to rupture, right? And I hypothetically went to the doctor and they prescribed me Oxycontin. Hypothetical, Hypothetical Oxycontin. Right. And because I'm pretty smart, I'm like, you know, or I've seen people have addiction. I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to take that. But, you know, hey, I can get about $10 a pill, maybe, you know. You just added another layer, though. You and Dr. Now they you. <laughs> you know, hypothetically. Hypothetically, of course. Why would I get in trouble when the doctors do the same thing? No, you're definitely right. That was part of the problem. She's not that. right, Peter. What do you mean? You're definitely right. She's no, not she right. Didn't. She just said if the doctor can give. No, I mean her question is why. The question is why can't I sell my my uh, oxy that I don't want to use? That's what her Hi question hypothetically is. Now. Hypothetically now. Hypothetically. Hi <laughs> Hypothetical. No, I mean what she's touching upon is is generally right. The concern was so why isn't you know my doctor getting in trouble? And in many ways we have dealt with that issue pretty well. The pill mills, so the the pharmacies that were working with the pill mills, there has been a lot of crackdown on them, and there should. But part of the problem is when you don't have a clear definition of of what is the problem, you move from the easy cases, the low hanging fruit. So you can tell these guys definitely were making a lot of money selling pills to junkies and we can prove it. But once you take the low hanging fruit with these law enforcement agencies, okay. supposed to the DA, then they move on to the easy, the next easy one, which unfortunately often is legit physicians who are following the law. Um, the documentary I mentioned earlier a little bit on HBO, Crime of Century, they focus on a guy called Oh, I'm sorry. My brain is tired. Damn. The physician they focus on is a guy. They they set him up. This is a guy that's terrible. He's putting people on these opioids, getting people addicted and killed. And then you find out actually he's one of the leading physicians in the country on establishing addiction medicine protocols to help prevent that kind of thing. The easy Once the easy answers are gone, law enforcement goes for the next best thing. So you have stories like the guy that wrote the 2016 CC guidelines that kind of uh, started the, the opioid prohibition part for patients, that side of it. He said in a meeting, I covered this for New York Daily News earlier this year. It's, it's an amazing moment. The guy says, okay, so I'm with my pain patients and I get a letter from the state medical board and my health provider, the, the hospital system I work for. And the letter says, you are prescribing too many opioids for your patients. This is a problem. And then you go down the letter and it cites that guy's name. Dr. Roger Chow, the 2016 CDC guidelines. And, and, and Roger, who is definitely a, he's, he's an addiction scientist, he fights very heavily on this. He's like, okay, so maybe, maybe something's going a little wrong here. Maybe we're getting misfocused on our efforts. The very guy who came up with uh, so many of these ideas here is now in trouble. Who is it going to get in trouble? And, and, and you can see this problem. I covered this for Reason Magazine with the opioid settlements. All these people are, are all the politicians that come up and say, this is wonderful. Uh, the state of uh, Colorado is going to get all this money. 
and we are going to send it for addiction treatment. But if you even look beyond the, P, the, the PR by just even a scintilla, you quickly notice that these things, they will not fly, okay? The, the laws aren't established. There's not really a lot of protection to start, stop the money from going to the general budgets. And what they consider addiction treatment can, can be if anything from preschool care to investing in our communities for better education to and basically any policy you want. And if it's your blue state, more lefty. If it's a red state, some more right-wing things. But these issues aren't being dealt with honestly. We aren't, we aren't focusing like Shamika was saying. You know, how come the guy that, that was actually doing this, how come he's not the one getting in trouble? That's a big question to ask because it feels like so much of this is people are being sold a pack of lies that we're dealing with this problem. The, the right people are being punished. When all the stats we have say that's not true, it's not working. Right. Uh, I, it's frustrating. I don't really have an answer beyond that. Well, a lot of times you're going to get to the point, like you said, once you get beyond the low-hanging fruit, they, these big agencies grow. They have people to pay. They bring on new people, and they don't want to do nothing. So, I mean, it, it's funny when people have issues in the in, in the larger sense with uh, criminal justice and law enforcement uh, entities that they want to reframe. But then they're like, cool, go after this person too. Go after this person too, right? It's like they want more of that. And I want to go to Will, but I, I want uh, to mention this too, which is interesting because Shamika said something about what they're saying about how they give drugs to people, especially in the black community. But on the flip side, you know, in the 1619 Project, they have an essay about this and they say it's proof of racism that blacks don't get the pain relief they need right so they say blacks need to get more drugs and they're not giving it to them because they're racist and they're in pain and they don't want to give them the drugs that they need not only is that bad but from prescribing my brother in it you know once you look up with the, the data that they use you find out this proof that that is not necessarily true but will what do you want to say to uh either the law enforcement or the doctor angle or any of this that they were talking about well, I think there are a couple things there. I mean, so first of all, I've heard that argument. Hey, hey, one second, guys. Sorry. Hold on. Hmm? Yeah. I, man, I can still talk. I I mean, you can still talk, I thought. I, I think he told you to shut up. That white man told you to shut up. Okay. What do we do? You're terribly offended. <laughs> Colonial, colonialism is coming back. Never again. Uhuru. Anyway, right. but no, I, I think there are a couple things there. So first of all, the... The black people don't get enough fentanyl argument has always... My apologies. Uh, I'm <laughs> well, they didn't I'm say supposed fentanyl, to, though. Supposed at, least they did, at least they didn't say fentanyl. They just said drugs in general. Yeah, but like the argument, like black people don't get enough Oxycontin to be totally balanced with it. It's always struck me as just a crazy example of how you can call anything racist. I had a conversation with one of my buddies who we'll call Jamarian about this. Um, and because that's his name. But I mean, like, so, but this, this guy was talking about just different types of racism and one of them was black people aren't prescribed hard body pain medicines like oxycontin and vicodin at the same rate as white guys and i said well we live in kentucky like 10 white people we know have died from these drugs like that this is this is the reason black people aren't suffering from the opiate epidemic and it was this sort of weird circular conversation where i was saying it's not a bad thing we're getting less heroin than the whites and he was saying well the idea that we're big athletes and warriors is a form of racism and it's the reason we're not prescribed you know the opiates as much and so on so anything can be racist in the modern era but i, I think a more serious point here though is it's hard to know how to regulate like evil legal behavior so the the four environments I've been in where people were acting the wildest, like openly doing things that were illegal or right on the verge, were the high school rave scene, actually, whatever the term is now, the uh, college Greek scene, the fraternity scene, black and white, um, the internet through about 2015, and working on a trading floor. Like, those were the places where I've seen easily the most sketchy, sexual, violent content and behavior. But when something is technically legal it's hard to know what to say about it. Like most white collar trading floor shenanigans aren't really against the law. If they are, it's hard to prove anything. It's perfectly legal to sell bullshit insurance to 500,000 people's grandmothers. I mean, there are entire bullpens that are set up just to do that. They call down into broke black and white communities in like Mississippi and act like your friend. I mean, that that's the outreach strategy. Um, that was the legal part of the Wolf of Wall Street. He was selling these BS penny stocks to garbage men and janitors that just wanted to be better in life. What do you do about that? It's hard. So 
why can't you sell drugs? I mean, like Shamika's question, I think because we generally think it's bad to sell heroin. But the question becomes, what do you do in a situation where it's legal for the doctor to do that? I actually, I have really strong feelings about this. Like, I think the medical industry in the United States has become basically a bunch of drug dealers to a very real extent. Like, if, and I know Charles Shamika, like if one of your buddies or one of your friends is a doctor, it's remarkable how true this is. Like, there are pill-selling reps for the pharma companies that will come to your office with, like, nice all-cotton hoodies and gold pins and stuff. They'll promise you a certain amount of money for each bottle of their pill that you move. So, I mean, in the USA, we use an incredible amount of psych meds and pharma drugs. Like, the, we use, I believe, I know we use more Adderall than China, for example. I think we're well ahead of the European Union combined, but that's because in the USA, there's a financial incentive to use these drugs. Like it doesn't make sense to say, I mean, one of the best treatments for depression is sex, another one is running, but it doesn't make sense to say, go on a date with your girlfriend or go do two miles because there's no financial gain there for the doctor. And you, you understand that at some level, people have to be thinking about that. So to some extent, the reason you can't sell drugs, but your doctor can't, Shamika, is that you would be competition. I mean, I, I think that that's really a lot of this. We see this with COVID, too. This is the last thing I'm prone to ramble. But like the COVID vaccine, they're now about to approve this for kids 5 to 11. And I, I looked at this the other day and without I'm, I'm on the right, but without getting into the whole vaccine controversy, the total number of deaths among kids 5 to 11 from COVID-19 throughout the pandemic, it's like 90. So... It's odd to think that there's no pharmaceutical incentive there. It, it's a crazy level of naivete to believe that Pfizer isn't thinking about the hundred dollars they're going to make per head for every one of the, what, 70 million people in that cohort. So that that is something that I think it has to be discussed what should legal business be able to do? When should you be able to give people drugs? And this goes over the line with a lot of other things too. Like what about, for example, gender transition surgeries? That's that's gonna be the new foothold. If, if, a, if a kid offers you $15,000 to chop off their breast, should you do it? It's a medical question. It's a philosophical right. question. What were you gonna say, Peter? Yeah, yeah you can, I, I'm sorry, I, was, I don't know why I was raising my hand. I think it's because he's a professor <laughs> at, at a college. All right. <laughs> Good job, young man. Um, I was going to jump in. This is kind of the problem with this. So chronic pain patients and people who rely on these medications, they see things like dope sick and they're like, this is crap. Because you're right. The problem is Sacklers, and they even said this in the Purdue with these Oxy trials. Johnson, Johnson are like, we're not doing anything radically different, guys. <laughs> we are just trying to get as many people on our medicines as we possibly can, which is how things are done in the pharmaceutical industry. I remember as a kid, um, my family, so my, my mom, my grandma, my dad, they're in medicine. My dad's a PA. My, my mom and grandma are nurses. And so the, a lot of the times you have the drug reps come by. And I remember when Zithromax, z pack you probably have all had it when you had a, a sinus infection or something. They would come by, and it's better than it used to be, but still pretty bad. And they would give you all kinds of crazy swag, hats, shirts. Some companies did get in big trouble offering vacations, that kind of thing. Um, and my dad would bring back some of this weird stuff. Like one time he brought back, it was like this like plush puppet, and it had Zithromax on the front. <laughs> it was like, here you go, kids. But this this was this is Maybe a real the drug problem. Dog. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a real, that's the kind Olympic of the problem here, right? It's because the, the behavior isn't really radically different. And the, I think, and then to, since you guys, some of you, will, like Wilfred, you guys lean conservative on this issue, you know, this is kind of a problem the libertarians, I think, have to some extent, especially the hardcore ones. They're like, if we just legalize that stuff, that will eliminate so many of the problems. And it might, definitely might some of them, but you still have, even with things that are completely legal and legit, you can still have a lot of problems from Yeah, how, how does that eliminate the 100,000 debt? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, what, what the problem is, is that they, they're going to get cleaner drugs? That, well, that's that, the idea is maybe the supply will be safer. So you aren't moving people away from addiction necessarily, but you aren't going to have these addicts end up dead. In the, in the states where marijuana is legal, do, they, do people still buy marijuana from their drug dealer? Some do actually. Yeah, some do. Most some, do. Some states. Some I mean, not that I would know hypothetically. Depends on the states. Most. 
It depends on the state, because like some states are heavily regulated, so getting uh, marijuana is very expensive. And it's taxed. In like, normal ways. <laughs> Yeah, and then in other states, it's 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 cheap, so it's not. Let's just say what we know. They legalize heroin. People are on the street buying cheap heroin. They are yeah, fair <laughs> because they're making I mean, it in the garage cigarettes. and they're mixing with stuff is dirt cheap yeah. because it's not real. Now, granted, some people would be saved because they'll say, "Well, I'll pay the extra fifteen bucks for the stuff I trust." I get that, but to the really poor person who's addicted, they want they can get more. They can you know, as the tolerance goes up, to get what they need. They will go with the cheaper stuff. So people would still buy the stuff from, you know, the people bringing it in and lacing it. We all know that. You don't need a study for that. Well, a big part of the problem is, I mean, pain medicine, pain medicine in general, modern medicine is still, I mean, we've got so much we can learn, but especially in pain medicine, but addiction medicine, even compared to pain medicine, that's like the dark ages, man. I mean, we just do not really have a good idea of how to deal with that issue. Yeah. I mean, 12 steps can help, but their efficacy rate is incredibly low. Um, and so we honestly don't have a lot of options available to effectively deal with these addiction issues. I mean, part of, I think part of the problem is with this idea that we're going to crack down these companies and individuals is kind of an immense like, we have all these people with addiction problems. We don't know what to do. I mean, and, and we never say that with like, any problem. Nobody, people has ide have ideas, which is good, but nobody just come out and says, well, I don't know what to do, right? <laughs> Especially no elected official. They just say, I truly don't know what to do. They don't say that. So they yeah, just start no, throwing so, stuff out there. Well, starting tomorrow, we're going to sell guns to give guns to Mexico, give the guns to the cartel and see what happens. They tried that. <laughs> I know I was messing with them, but yeah, they start, uh, they, try, my point is they try crazy stuff because they don't want to just say, I don't know, let's take a step back and think. They just say, uh, let's throw some stuff at the wall. Yeah, no, and I mean, harm reduction, it can, because the idea behind harm reduction is try to reduce the risk you're putting people that will engage in really bad, risky behaviors. So you're hoping that you can keep this person alive long enough. So at least one day in the future, hopefully they can get their act together. But we, we have just very, I mean, methadone, buprenorphine, there are some addiction drugs that, that can help. But again, these are extremely difficult things that are even in the best circumstances and with every resource are extremely difficult to get on top of. I mean, addiction, sometimes addiction feels like it's a demon on your back. You're like, I don't understand why I keep engaging this behavior. It seems to take it over my life and my free will. And we're getting better at it, but we still have a heck of a lot to learn. So what do we do? I would say the, since we know the policies aren't working, we should stop with those. I mean, if we're cracking down, okay, if we are got past the pill mills and cracking down physicians and patients isn't helping, then we need to stop doing that. I think we need to be able to admit, you know, part of the problem is we, we can't admit about the problems with the legal drugs on the street, especially coming through the border. Those are too politically hot because everything right now is about uh, disparities and uh, looking at people based on their race. And unfortunately, many, many times people pushing drugs. I mean, many, of course, are white, but you know, some that also happens if they're in the black community, they're black. Well, no, you know, the, the especially the more progressive types, they don't want to, they don't want to think about that. I mean, we're not being adults on these, these issues. We're trying to use top down solutions where we don't really have to think about the issue. And we leave the people who actually have an issue and their families high and dry. And it is incredibly frustrating, not just the patients and their families that have been uh, abandoned, and many millions have, but also the many millions of people who have addiction issues who, who were put into situations that were risky and not good for them, and they've been abandoned as well. And society doesn't have an answer for them. Federal government certainly doesn't. And I think we won't be able to deal with these issues until we handle it like adults and admit that there are going to have to be some tough decisions made, and we are going to have to try to... Uh, at times put more trust in people other times you're going to have to admit that certain there are certain problems we need to deal with this well for Riley is covered there are there are real problems in certain areas of our society that are just culturally our big no-nos and we hurt ourselves by not dealing with them wow yeah i mean that's a tough road i mean that's going to be a long fix um a lot of moving parts anything you want to leave us with uh shamika and or will well, I will say Will has uh, started my mind to racing, and I was wondering if where we are in society now, if there's hypothetically a black market for transition uh, drugs. I, 
hypothetically hypothetically uh in the hypothetical region of the internet known hypothetically as the dark net you can buy slaves and pretty much anything else and yeah you can you can definitely buy the thing with the trans stuff is that it's not really the drugs that transition you the drug is just tea if you're a girl like it's a, if you're female the drug is just testosterone and i mean you can buy that in most gyms like, mm -hmm. certain forms of it aren't even illegal. Like, if you want to take HGH or creatine or any of that stuff, I mean, you pretty much just go down to Walmart. And this, again, yeah, it actually, creatine, you can definitely grab. HGH might depend. You might need one doctor's script. But this, this is a big part of all this. Like, a lot of the stuff that you can get in the USA is either legal. Like, I mean, you know, if you okay. go to whatever that health food store is, you can get like pure 5-HTP, you can get testosterone boosters, bottles of B12, DMAA, which is speed, or it's kind of regulated, but you can get it from the doctor. And that's one of the issues with the drugs in our culture. Like almost everyone is on something most of the time. I mean, people wake up in the morning with a speed pill or Starbucks and they finish with a couple shots or a couple beers later at night. Nothing wrong with that, but that's something you don't see in every culture in the world as versus the USA, France, and so on. But anyway, with the trans stuff, it's not really the drug that people would depend on. It's kind of the surgery and everything else that goes along with that. And yeah, there's a market for that from legal to illegal. And yeah, that's really, that's really heavily advertised in different sectors of the internet. But for most of it, I guess my, my point throughout this has been you probably don't even need the dark net. You might need the dark net for a certain amount of pure tea, but like if you want a binder, if you want the surgery, which some people jokingly call yeeting the teats, like you just cut your top surgery, any of that, if you're over 15, you just look, you search, you go to the doctor. So like maybe back alley transition surgery? That's kind of crazy. I mean, yeah. You could probably get some, some back alley surgery on the internet. You probably don't want to, but you probably could do it. No, I mean, could I give it is what I'm thinking. Well, you could. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess. It, now, that's something you actually would probably want to be an expert to do, like the vaginal transition Wouldn't surgery. Wouldn't hurt me. They'd be the one struggling. <laughs> Just a bunch of bodies going out the back door. It's terrible what Shamika did. <laughs> Great relationship went. Collapsed. Look how quickly she graduated from selling the drugs she got from her doctor that she didn't need. Killing people, killing trans. Tr to the idea performing trans surgery in the alley. Yeah, but I mean, there are a lot of deep questions that come up with some of this, though. Like, black markets automatically exist if you make something illegal. So, like, right. you really can go on to, I mean, back in the day, it was Silk Road. Now it's like dark market. Can't, you know, now it's band vaccine mandate cards. Well, yeah, oh, that's that's another thing. Yeah, you don't even need the dark net for that. But like, there's there's a there's a black market in pretending to be vaccinated. But yeah, pretty much pretty much anything that we try to ban, some smart hustler is going to sell in another location for five percent more money. So the question is, when are laws worth it? I guess when do they right. make enough of an impact to st that that the reduction is worth the cost and the annoyance and so on? I don't know. With yeah, I mean, it's going to have to. I would probably yeah, it's gonna have to be a, a get rid of the distinction. Oh, I said with drugs, I would probably legalize all drugs and get rid of this fake distinction to some extent. Like, I think there should be social sanctions against being a drug addict, but I also think there are people that really want their pain medicine, and I don't see a blunt of Kush as necessarily worse than a bottle full of pills. So, well, that's because you, like Shamika, will also be. Uh, you're like, I'm an adult and I'm okay. And I like free will. So I'm okay with, with let the bodies hit the floor, let the bodies hit the floor. So when it goes from 100 to 200, it's like, Hey, but they had free will. Well, all men die. Right. But I mean, like it beyond <laughs> that though, which is, is a famous and true line. It's one of the few things Jesus and Genghis Khan agreed on. Um, but I mean, beyond that, I don't know if you would see much more death because the thing is anyone who has access to the dark net or anyone who has a doctor or can get these drugs today. So like when Shamika asked, what's the difference between me and Merck or Pfizer? I think the difference is that they have better advertising. Like I don't- Yeah, but I don't think most people who have addiction are going onto the dark net though. Because they, they, I mean, they would have the incentive to do so if they need to, but they can just go right on the corner right now and get with, and get their uh, addiction uh, met. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, like one, you can just go to, I mean, if you're a middle-class citizen, you can just go to your doctor. And I think- one Right, of right, right. I mean, the people who aren't middle-class though. Yeah, well, yeah, then you can just walk down to the block, go see Jose. I mean, yeah, it's it's not very hard to get drugs in the USA. So the, que the question, I guess, is, is there a point to any level of prohibition? And I don't, 
I don't know. It's a pretty tough question. Well, yeah, it's definitely hard. I, I, did, I think I want to, you know, kind of end with this point when we try to fix it. None of us, I mean, it's a big thing. You got, we didn't even mention lobbyists, all these other things, but from a law standpoint, um, just like most things, it's not going to fix it. But obviously the issue is a little different now, but opioids themselves, the drug isn't new. I don't know, you know, I'm a big music buff, but I don't know if most people know that most of the stars of the jazz eras, you know, your Miles Davis and all them, they were all doing opioids in the 20s and 30s. That was the drug you did now. I mean, then they weren't doing crack, they were taking opioids. I mean, it's what people did. So it's not like it's new, right? It's just how you get it and where you get it from and how potent it is, that ebbs and flows. So, you know, it, I mean, it's not going to go away. It's just like, like Will said, I guess we'll have to think about what level of um, regulation we need. But I think the problem is the people who don't want regulation ask for more regulation and the people who want regulation say we should have less regulation. So most of us can't even decide what we want to do. That's going to be what the problem is. But uh, I guess we should uh, have Peter uh, back and we should talk about this again. Maybe uh, revisit the topic. Uh, he is Pete Pischke, uh, Peter Pischke. He is a freelance writer on health issue. And thank you for uh, joining us. And thank you all no, for watching. Thank you. This is really cool. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks all for uh, watching and listening. And we'll catch you next week. Patria J, I'm saving the day from you commies who let know you can't fuck with me. I got a country to save. God bless the US of A. Land of the free and a home of the brave. God get all of the praise. I got a country to save because I'm Patriot J and I'm saving a day.